Um, I'm introducing Dr. James Hill, an associate professor in the Department of Computer and Information Science at Indiana University, Purdue University in Indianapolis. He received his PhD and Master of Science in Computer Science from Vanderbilt University and Bachelor of Science in Computer Science from Morehouse College. Dr. Hill's research is in the area of software and system engineering for large-scale distributed software systems, focusing on domain-specific modeling, system emulation, real-time software instrumentation, software performance analytics, and its application toward understanding the performance of such systems continuously throughout the software lifecycle. Dr. Hill's research has been sponsored by both public and private organizations, such as the Australia Defense Science and Technology Organization, Department of Homeland Security and National Science Foundation, Air Force Research Lab, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Gun Grunman, and Amazon. Today, he will present a little talk titled, The Little Program That Cried Wolf. Go ahead. Thank you for the introduction. All right, so before I get into the talk, I just want to get into this fable that we all know and were told as a, a child um, called The Little Boy Who Cried Wolf, all right? So as we know the story, how it goes, there was a little boy who was watching a flock of sheep for the villagers up, that were downhill, and he thought it would be interesting to just basically cry wolf because he knew that wolves were going to come for the sheep and he knew that if he said that, it would get the villagers to come up the hill to try to help save the sheep. So the little boy cried wolf the first time, and the, sh the villagers came up the hill to try to help get away, help, help, you know, uh, tell the, help run the uh, wolf away. And when he got there, he realized that there was no wolf. So he told them, you know, do not cry wolf unless there's really a wolf. And they go back down the hill. Second time, he goes, wolf, wolf. They come up the hill and they see there's no wolf, and they get upset at him and go back down the hill. The third time, he sees actually a wolf over in the bushes coming towards the sheep, and he screams, wolf, wolf, and we all know what happens. The villagers stay downhill, they don't come uphill. And unfortunately, in this case, the, sh the actual wolf comes for the sheep and scares them away. When the villagers finally come up the hill to get their, wolf, to get their sheep at the end of the day, the boy's there, sitting there crying, and the, the villagers asked, well, what happened? And he said, well, a wolf came, I called. And a wolf came, I called, a wolf was coming, and he, nobody came. And the, the actual wolf scared the sheep away. And the villagers said, basically, well, don't cry wolf. And the moral of the story is that even when you tell the truth, if you tell a lie when you tell the truth, they will not believe you. And so this gets us into the talk of, of what we're going to be talking about today, about this idea of, of these, these programs that we think may be crying wolf, and what impact they're having on us as developers and so forth. So let's look at a, a simple scenario, okay? You've been admitted to a hospital. You've been hooked up to an IV. It's going to give you some drugs. And as you're laying there, you notice that you start dozing off. And you wake up maybe two or three days later, and you realize that you were out for those two or three days. And you ask, well, what happened? And it turns out that that medical device that was used to actually pump the drugs into your system was actually pumping in too much at a time. And it caused you to actually go into a, a minor coma for some time. Now, is this actually realistic? It can happen, yes. So in the past five years, the FDA has received over 10,000 complaints about infusion pumps. If you go look down at the very bottom, it says how McAfee was able to find a way to take a implanted insulin pump and make it give you 45 days worth of dosage in one shot, in one shot. All right? And then we can look at outside the medical domain and come to something more closer to us. Has anybody heard of the heart bleed problem? All right? The heart bleed problem, basically, for those who are not familiar with it, was basically an error that was actually put in the source code by a developer back in 2012, an oversight, a simple oversight. And what really happens is that whenever you go to a website and you see the HTTPS, you're communicating over something called an SSL, a secure socket layer. So it ensures that all your communication going over that, that, that protocol over HTTP is actually secure. So it can't be decrypted, right? It can't be spoofed. It can't be hacked. Well, whenever two, a client and a server communicate with each other over that protocol, they're sending each other a heartbeat saying, hey, are you still alive? And the server responds with, yes, I am alive. 
I'm still there. So keep the channel up. Now what this bug was doing was basically was that a person who wanted to attack a server was able to basically say, when it sent over this heartbeat to the server, it would say, hey, here is a message I want you to relate to me. But the buffer that I want you to send, the amount of data I want you to send back to me is this ginormous amount, maybe a megabyte worth of data, even though I only have space for maybe three or four bytes of data. And so the server will actually not validate that check and basically will say, all right, if you need um, you know, a meg worth of data, I'm going to just basically give you that much memory or much data and send it back over the network. And what was happening basically is because they were, they were using more or returning more data than what was supposed to be returned, you had a situation where basically the hacker was able to get things like passwords, get your very private information, because it was stored in memory that was already not used anymore. And so you're basically just gobbling up all this old memory and just sending it back over the network. Now, this was introduced in 2012. We did not find out that this was a problem until 2014, two years. It went undetected. And there was roughly 17% of all internet services were impacted by this bug. Your private stuff is going over, all right? And we know that software is growing more and more complex. So for example, cars, your BMW S series has roughly a million lines of source code. They're saying cars are getting to upwards of 70% of software is in your car, is, is, run by, is your car is run by software. Think about this, when you go to the mechanic, you don't actually go in there, the mechanic actually, when you ask, say there's a problem, the mechanic basically pulls out a machine, plugs it into the dashboard, and runs all these tests. It's computerized. We have defense systems growing more complex. Even your airplane, if you've ever been on an Airbus A380, that is really an engineering marvel. It is awesome what it, is, what it does, what it can do. Or you have your, basically your, your, your homes, your automated homes, where everything now is connected over the internet. Right? Your doorbell, your garage, your lights, your fans, your alarm system. And we can even look at just simple systems that you play with every day, Facebook and Twitter. Like Facebook is no longer just your simple, simple page where you can go and look at somebody's profile but there's so much happening in that system, all right? And these systems are growing more and more and more and more complex. So if we just look at just something we, we know that you use all the time, for example, let's look back at some, this, like, look at some systems that have evolved over the, over the decades. For example, Microsoft Windows. Back in the day in 1993, Microsoft Windows was roughly six million lines of code. That was what Windows was. If you look at 2005, it was roughly 50 million lines of code. Look at Linux. In 2000, it was 55 million lines of code. Or in 2000, right? And now up to basically 2005 is 215 million lines of source code. That's a huge jump. Exponential increases. Or you can go into your healthcare systems and look at just radio, radio, radio therapy treatment planning systems. A million lines of source code, meaning that there are people writing this code. People are actually writing this code that's running all this software that is basically used in all our systems nowadays. And one thing you find out is that as systems start to increase, vulnerabilities start to increase in these systems. So if you listen to some of the talks from today, they talk about the vulnerabilities and things like your power grid and so forth. Right? So for example, Carnegie Mellon keeps track of database where they keep track of known vulnerabilities in software. And in their database back in 1999, they had roughly 400 there and now in 2006, they have documented 8,000 vulnerabilities in software that they've tracked. All right, MITRE Corporation, they actually keep a list of, and we're going to talk about this in more detail as well, they keep a list of all known vulnerabilities. You can't see this in the back, but basically right here, to date, there's roughly 78,000 plus that they've documented in software, vulnerabilities that exist. And so you may say, well, how do we actually combat this, okay? We as developers, we have different techniques that we can use, different tools. And one type of tool we can use is something called a static code analysis tool, all right? And the way a static code analysis tool works is it says, here basically is it's just a way of trying to detect errors in your software, all right? It just tries to detect potential vulnerabilities in your software. And the way it works is that say, if I have a source file, I take that source file, run it through some tool, and that tool is going to give me out a report, right? It's going to give me out a report. 
this report is just going to tell us developers, the ones who's writing all this code, where are the potential vulnerabilities. It'll tell us what file it was in, what line it was, what kind of issue it was that it detected. And then it's our job as developers to just look at that information and try to resolve these issues. This on top of actually trying to meet deadlines that are pushed down by managers to get out so that you don't overrun your budget. Because the software has to get out, because if it doesn't get out, they don't make no money. But in reality, when we look at it, as software starts to increase in complexity, these tools, they start out with a small space like this, where it's this massive graph of having to look through it. But as software starts to become more and more complex, the task becomes more daunting. And it grows, and it grows. And so right now, you're trying to look basically through all this code these graphs to try to figure out where is there a potential vulnerability that can actually cause a hack. For example, with Heartbleed. When we look at heart, the Heartbleed example, when I had a chance to go to a, a meeting with the leaders of leading researchers in this area, we actually found out that no tool actually could detect the Heartbleed. No tool detected it. After it came out, the tools were updated to detect it, but no tool detected it. So it went away for two years, because they're looking through all this code to try to find problems, trying to find these small little problems. So to give you an idea of what this problem may look like, here's a simple example. All right? Now I told myself I would try to go through this talk without giving any source code. I tend to talk with no source code, but unfortunately, I can't. So just a small piece of source code. All right? On the left-hand side, we have a simple program that basically allocates a buffer of size 10. And the second line right here, A10 of 0, says set the 10th character, in this case the 11th character, or 10th index, i.e. the 11th character, to 0. Now in computer science, everything basically is zero-based indexing. So in other words, 10 really is the 11th position. If you look at the graph on the, other, the image on the left hand, on the right-hand side, there is no 10th position, there's no 11th position. There's only how many positions? 10. All right, so in this case right here, you're accessing space that's outside of what you've been allocated. That's like having a row of 10 chairs, and you tell somebody to sit on the 11th chair. There's no chair there in this case. All right? This is kind of what Heartbleed was doing, where basically they were accessing stuff that was basically way off in no man's land that they weren't supposed to be touching. All right? So in this case, a static code analysis tool, when it looks at a simple program like this, and this is very trivial, it's going to basically say you have basically out of bounds access, which can be right so it looks at almost like a buffer overflow. A tool will give this warning to a developer, and it's our job to say, okay, you're correct. We need to fix this problem. All right? Now, when it comes to what tools are available, you can go out to Wikipedia, which I tell all my students to do when we're talking about this, this area and say, well, find some tools that you can use for your program. You can go there and you will get this massive list of different tools that are available. All right, so this right here is probably four or five percent of all the tools that you can use in this area. All right, some specialize on different languages, some specialize on different areas, concerns, different weaknesses, different vulnerabilities, trying to deal with your, what we we'll call your attack surface. But then that raises one question that you have to ask yourself. If I have a list of all these tools to choose from, the first question you have to ask yourself is, what tool do I choose? We have to ask ourselves that. What tool do I choose in this case? And many times you end up basically having to have an argument between yourself of which one do I use? Is it commercial or is it open source? Commercial means you pay for it. Open source means it's free. You can get it, download it, and use it. The commercial tools are very expensive. Open source tools are usually free. So you can imagine in this case that once you know what language you're using for to develop your system, you now have to basically figure out what tool you're going to use. And so this is a question we asked ourselves in this area. What tool do you use because nobody's really reporting on these studies because of license agreements where you can't report these, the findings for these tools? And so we did some study in this area. And we said, how do different tools apply on, diff on, on a given code base? And some things we found out was that you can take two tools, apply it on the same code, and get different results. One tool will say there's a problem. One tool will say there's not a problem. One tool may mislabel the problem, and one tool may get it correctly. 
or both tools may actually miss the problem. So now you see how the daunting task becomes, where if I have to choose these tools, and oh, different tools are giving me different results, which one do I trust? Who's crying wolf and who's not crying wolf? Because if one tool is actually correct and one tool is not correct, then somebody has to be screaming a wolf in this case. We also found out if you take multiple tools and put them together, you can increase your chances of actually finding more stuff, potentially. But the flip side is that the more times you combine the tools, your errors, your, your false, we call them false positives, the wolf calls, those go up exponentially. So now you have a situation where you can find more but you're going to get more noise. Now, if I have more noise coming to me, the question now becomes, of all that noise that I'm being, having to deal with, what is actually truly a problem? If I gave you a hundred to, if I say you have to search through a thousand balls or a thousand errors to find the one error that actually was the, the actual true error, would you continue on? Or would you actually stop after the first one or two? How would you approach that problem? How'd you deal with that? And as software gets more and more complex, the actual errors that are generated grow up exponentially as well, in this case. So the question now becomes, are tools really crying wolf in this case? All right? And so one thing we found out was that if you put developers in a situation, a lot of times they ignore the warnings because they don't have time to go through all of them. Or if they actually look at some of the warnings, they look at the wrong ones. They start looking at the actual wrong errors in this case. All right? So just imagine in this situation right here, to put it in perspective, what if you went and your cancer screening test or your, your email was wrong 90% of the times? Would you trust that test? Would you? If your spam filter, every time you had an email come in, it went into the spam box, would you trust it? You would want to do what? Turn it off. Just turn it off. Because otherwise, it's just noise that you are having to deal with in a situation. And we saw that this happens a lot of times. So there are some solutions to actually addressing this problem, right? Because again, as software grows more and more complex, it does make it feel like it's this daunting task where we're just going down a, a bad road. So we can either say we can create something new, right? So if all the tools are bad, let's create something new. But creating something new just puts you in that same position again. Because you now are going to basically be in the same position as all the other tools because you can start generating these false, false positive or these false warnings. You can update something old, but they only tax one, one tool as opposed to many different tools. Or you can find a way to support everybody, something new and old. And so what we're looking at right now is just a solution that we're looking at and we're working on in our lab um, that's giving some good results right now is we're saying, is there some kind of way that if we take the current approach, as you have the tools come in, you have some kind of filter that helps you learn what is actually good versus what's bad. Focus on what you really know is a problem, not what you think is a problem. Right? Kind of like a spam filter, in a sense. And then the report you get back is not only just what the problem was, but also how well we think that is actually a problem. So there are a lot of benefits to this approach that we, if we can apply it in our area, it can address some of these daunting tasks. So for example, the users, they get a reduction in the warnings. Developers have access to real world problems. And we're going to get to that second one in a minute when we talk about some of our results of how we actually apply this. And in evaluators, we have this generated data set we can start learning how to actually get rid of some of these problems in these tools. So really how we look at understanding false, these, these, call these false positives, we first start off with just a simple process of selecting tools, finding a code base to work on, identify the false positives, get down to the essence of the problem, and then try to catalog this and more importantly, give feedback to the, end, to the, to the developers so they can hopefully fix, up, fix their problems. So when it comes to selecting tools, we've looked at commercial and open source tools because they offer different types of, of standards, different types of quality, look at different issues and so forth. When it comes to selection identification, we actually use some of these standard test suites to try things out. So for example, one test suite we've looked at is something called the Juliet test suite, where it has roughly 61,000 known flaws in software that we've documented. Examples of test cases, and they're clearly marked saying, hey, here's a flaw in your source code where there's going to be a vulnerability, a memory leak, a, 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 a potential buffer overflow that can basically deal with the heart bleed issue. Or here's some code that had a flaw that has been fixed. 
to see if the tool actually can detect that that flaw was gone and so forth. So if we look at some basically the examples of Juliet where they clearly mark the stuff. So if you look at it, it says false positive buffer access out of bounds. They clearly did log exactly where these problems are so we know exactly where the issue is and how to resolve it. The reduction process looks at saying, if I have some source code, let's get rid of all the garbage that's throwing off these tools. So we can get down to just what is the essence. So for example, on the left hand side, this could be some code that the developer looks at. When you actually use our process, we can get you down to just these three lines of code will actually cause the tool to give a false positive. That way we can start hopefully understanding these patterns that are popping up. Then we get into the idea of this notion of trying to catalog these false positives. Right, where we keep track of what is going on, these warnings, so we can hopefully learn from this. So we get things like the warnings, description, what tools are causing this, how often are they occurring, and so forth. The code samples, context, different changes that will actually cause it to go away. Because we feel that it's not only the tool's job to find the problem, but it's also the developer's job to actually help the, pro help the tool out. And then the last part was the validation where we say, here's what we found, and we go right to the developers and say, can you actually confirm this is really an issue with your problem, with your tool? Because if we see it as an issue, then somebody else is seeing it as an issue. If you can fix that issue, then it can basically make it much easier for us to address these wolves, these wolf calls that developers are seeing. So when we had this, this little study, we said, well, did we learn anything from this? Were we just doing this in a vacuum? Did we learn anything from this? So as we start running our test cases, we actually started seeing these patterns emerge in the systems, these tools that we use. Three or four different tools we use. What we're seeing here is basically a hierarchical graph where basically as a pattern, or as, a, as a warning emerged, if we start seeing that warning pop up and we start seeing variations for it, we got a second level. So we're really seeing that basically it's the top level, it basically represents the basically common generality of what these tools are complaining about. And as we start getting down in our tree, we start seeing the different variations of that same pattern manifesting itself in the software. Now the colors basically represent the different tools that were giving that false positive. So what we're seeing in this case, basically we're, see we're seeing this pattern merge where we're seeing not only is there a relationship between the false positives, but different tools were having the same problem, having the same issue on the same pieces of source code. We're generating the same problems over and over. So we're seeing this commonality happening across different tools. And a lot of it has to deal with the complexity of the source code that's being analyzed. If we dug a little bit deeper into, this, into the actual test cases, on the left-hand side of this graph, we're seeing all the different classifications that we came up with from this graph right here. The rows represent the different types of vulnerabilities we were checking out. We were seeing in this case that a lot of tools were generating false positives for specific types of weaknesses as well. So when we actually did a subset of, this, of, this, of the entire Juliet test suite, 61,000 test cases, we only probably scanned about 20% of those. Within those 20%, we actually had a roughly 827 false positives that were generated. Just for a simple test case, test suite of very simple problems. Not the complex problems, but the simple problems. We consider this basically having issues with doing basic mathematics, arithmetic. Not trying to basically have problems of, of a piece of software, which we basically say is the equivalent of trying to do calculus or linear algebra. The basics, in this case. So then lastly, we said, we have all this data, let's go back and talk to developers and see what they think about this. Because if we as the tool vendors, because if we as developers are trying to address this daunting task where introducing source code that is, has these, these known issues, and if developers are not actually listening to these tools, in some cases they aren't, then we have to basically figure out how to get that, that noise off. We have to ask the developers, could you help us resolve these problems? Otherwise, you can introduce these introduce vulnerabilities into the source code because the developers basically just ignore the warnings and so forth. And so we contacted one of the, in one case, we contacted one of our commercial tool vendors that we use in our study, and we provide them with just one test case that we found, one result, just one, 
out of the 17 that we had found altogether so far. Just one. And the first thing they did on the phone call was that as soon as we said we were using the Juliet test suite, the first thing they said was, we don't trust that test suite. It's contrived. It's fake. It's not real source code. It's not real world examples. And so we spent five minutes trying to debate them of why we were using that test suite. Just give us, just not end up saying, just give us the benefit of the doubt, please, in this one case. And we gave them that one example. And it was interesting enough is that when we gave them that one example, they came back and said, wow, you actually found a bug in our system. You found a flaw. So they were giving off a warning, but it was an issue in their tool in this case. So they have these test suites to help find these problems, but even the developers aren't trusting the test suite sometimes. And so we took all our results and we gave these, gave it to the developer and we had some interesting things comes back where we said that we were able to find three patterns that were confirmed to be actually general false positives. One pattern they said, well, it can't really happen. One pattern they couldn't reproduce and they're currently reviewing four other ones at the time that we did this work. And we, together, we've actually sent them over at least another 10, 10, 10 plus more problems to look at in a situation. All right? So one thing we actually did in this project, we said we were able to convince these tool developers to actually trust these test suites because there's something there. These test suites come from known problems in software that you should trust. And so now we're actually are using them, and we're using this test suite to continue validating our results and our findings and so forth. And we're getting really good results in this case. Because as we find these problems, we're able to reduce the amount of noise that these tools are generating. And a reduction in the noise makes it where the developers start trusting the tools even more, and so forth. So now I say, so, so what? We did all this, we went to the developers, we said, here are some problems, we can help you fix your tools, make them more sound. So what does this mean for us, right? Because we know software is continually to grow and grow and grow more complex. So one thing that as I teach my students and I say is that it takes a village, all right? There are three, there are three parties that are really involved in this situation. You have the actual users of these tools, you have the educators, and you have developers of the tools. All right? The users of those tools need to try to trust these tools more, one. But more importantly, they need to try to report these problems to the tool developers so they can actually find the problems. Developers need to trust the test suites. Listen to the people who actually give back feedback, and we're seeing this happen more now, and so forth. Educators, like myself, we have to be mindful of how do we teach our students because eventually the people who graduate from college or go back to some boot camp to learn how to program, they eventually start writing source code. They're the ones that basically have the potential to put vulnerabilities into the software as they start writing code. I do it myself sometimes on accident where I'm just writing code really quickly because we're human, we make mistakes. Us educators have to understand how to teach students how to develop code correctly, how to leverage these tools correctly, so that basically the tools are not having to search through so much. So they're not having to basically try to report on so much. Because again, if you give a tool something really bad, it's going to produce something bad. If you give it something good, it's going to produce something good. And we're going to look at also basically some things that are happening as well um, from the developer point of view to help deal with the situation. We're also seeing this emergence of these services that are popping up. So for example, there are three different services that I, I've, I know and I've used before. One called Codacity one called Code Climate, the other called the Software Assurance Marketplace, which is sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security. And these basically are test beds where they take these tools and they allow you as a developer to come in and use them. And they continually evaluate your code as you develop it. So when you start with that initial idea, if you can leverage these services, it can check for vulnerabilities. So that way it's not looking through a large code base, but it's looking through a small code base to start off with, and as your system grows, it actually is able to adjust to that, to that growth and find problems before, you get too, before the system gets too big. And then lastly, when it comes to developers, we have to give these tools a helping hand. All right? 
In order for us to actually help these tools not have to search through a, solution, to a, through a large search space, as in that graph was showing you, we have to also give these tools some kind of hint about what the issue, or what the context is we're working with. So for example, here is just some simple source code where we have two little, where the arrow shows these, we call these annotations. This allows the developer to give a hint to the tool saying either it's going to be this or it's going to be that. For example, in the case of the nullable situation, it's really saying that this object right here cannot exist. There's a good chance it may not exist when it returns. It may point to nothing. The non-null says, at some, we know that, that this object will always exist. Now, why is this actually very powerful? This is very powerful because what this does is, in the case of the non-null, if we know that it can never not exist, I meaning it will always exist, you've cut your search space in half already. You do not have to worry about all the other states and other situations and the other paths that can go when it doesn't exist. But in the case of the nullable, this now basically allows the tool to say, if you are not checking that it does not exist, we have a problem here. So now you actually give awareness, and we know that there, this warning is not really a false positive. It is actually a wolf. It's not just crying wolf, but it's actually really a wolf in this situation. So in closing, if you think about this, is the little program really crying wolf? That's something I've always, we always ask my, my students who work on these projects. Is it really crying wolf? And the answer is actually maybe. Because it depends on the context that we're working with in this situation. If we can improve it or allow these programs to understand the context that we're working in as developers, then there's a much better chance that what the actual tool is saying, you should believe. If you force the tool to have to guess what you're thinking, there's a 50% chance that it could be wrong. And so the more information we can give to these tools, to help them understand what's going on. The more times we can actually have rules that say what's really going on in the software that these tools can actually piggyback on, there's a good chance that situations like the heart bleed or the pacemakers, that they don't get hacked because of maybe some simple vulnerability that a developer put in the code on accident that the tool found and was either overlooked by the developer or the tool did not find because there was not enough information there to understand what it was trying to evaluate. So thank you. Um, so, I've seen recently uh, two different tools um, for formatting code and linting code, and one would automatically format the code a certain way, and as soon as it did that, then it would throw a different error with the linter. Um, but then my uh, question that I have um, also uh, related to warnings and errors and false positives what to do about that. I've heard some strategies treat all warnings as errors, um, not just security warnings, but any warning is an error, or do people just get so tired of it not building that they just ignore it, kind of like you said. So what's the, what's the best strategy? Um, from a business point of view, the best strategy is do what you have to do to get the thing out the door by the deadline. Right? That's the, the business strategy. That's yeah. the, unfortunately, that's the strategy that usually takes place because, as I tell my, my students in my social class, you know, when you start writing software, um, where you go into, the, into, into industry, um, unfortunately, you have hours you have to clock, and that's tied to some, some rate, that's tied to some project that has some type of billing and, and so forth, right? So you can't spend all your time just dealing with these issues. Yeah. And so, it all depends on the context, and this is unfortunately what happens, it all depends on the context of the application, right? If it's a mission critical application like that's running your smart city or that's running an airplane, you need to make sure that you treat all errors as, 
you know, or our warning is errors because you don't know. You don't read a situation where it was flagged, you let it go through, and then you have something fatal happen, unfortunately, right, in a situation. Um, but if it's just a simple, and we see this happen all the time, right, when you look at just your, your everyday business software, where they release it, there's problems, and they just put out patches, right, um, to fix these vulnerabilities. Because as you start finding, try to search more for more and more you know, flaws or dealing with that, um, you get into these diminishing returns, where the amount of time it takes to find the next problem, it's going to increase, you know, it's going to be just be worse off, right? Yeah. Um, so in that situation, you, you know, you, you, it all depends on the context, right? Either treat, if you're dealing with some mission critical, you treat it like that. Okay. Otherwise, you just, sometimes you, people just literally just start ignoring some of the stuff. Um, and you can always, in the, in the case of that situation, those are the easy ones to deal with, okay? Those are the easy ones because those are just simple, um, in, our wor in our world, it's just like almost a regular expression search where we just look for a specific pattern in the text. The more complicated ones, which are like the hard bleed ones, where you start looking at the actual data flow through the system, right? How you're flowing through the system, how the code flows through the system, and so forth. Now that's when you start getting into the problem where those are the ones that take a lot more time to, to try to investigate. Um, and hopefully you can try to distinguish between which ones are more of, you know, syntactical, you know, simple, regular expression ones, right, versus ones that are more data flow ones that you need to really look at, and so forth. Okay, awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. When you look at ecosystems like JavaScript, so there's one for you, right? <laughs> um, you know, they, they explode all over the place, and there's framework after framework after framework, and you're wrapping and wrapping and wrapping, and you do all this fun stuff. Uh, how, how do you control for those kinds of environments that the ecosystems are so wild and out of control, so to speak? What, what do you do for those? And, you know, you're, you're burying stack traces and useful information, and you can't even get to it. So how does a, how does a code testing tool even help in that? And, how do you help control for that? Well, that's actually one of the biggest problems right now. Um, let's, so it's two parts in that, situ that question. So one is the, the ecosystem of the, like the JavaScript ecosystem. And the other issue is the notion of, of multiple software la layers that exist in software. Um, so let's look at the software la layer issue. So that's actually a really hard problem because um, one, we don't build software from ground up anymore. Instead, we just assemble pieces. And if you're doing it in the Java world, you're working with Node.js, you go out there and find what module does what I need. You add it, and you just keep it moving. Right? And we just hope, we just hope that that developer is using these tools to check their software out. Right? So it's this trust factor. So if you go back to the idea of where I said we have these different things, you just hope that they're using something like this. Right? Where, um, and I say, I don't work for any of these companies. I'm not really pitching. It's just, these are tools we have where we can put badges like on our GitHub repository to say how well this tool is, right? So for example, Codacity would give you a grade letter between A and F on your code. If your repository is really good, it'll give you an A. If it, ha if it has vulnerabilities and it has a lot of them, it'll give you an F, right? So it gives you those grades. So you as a developer can decide, am I going to use this in my software or not, right? Am I going to bring it in? But you get, to, you get a situation where you have something like Heartbleed, which was in the open SSL, which is trusted by almost every service that's Linux, right? Where it was so deeply buried that it was hard to find, right? So you always have that case where as you start having software level stack, you just hope that, 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 that those layers below you are done correctly, right? Just like how we trust Windows and Linux are secure when we actually put op, you know, clap, pro, uh, programs on that. Now on the JavaScript side, that question, that actually, there's actually some interesting results that we found um, in our findings and we weren't using JavaScript. Um, we found out that a lot of the issues that were occurring in these systems in the Juliet test case we were running, which is mostly C and C++, it was a result of something called global variables, which are known to be bad. And the issue with the global variable is that the state can change at any point in time by somebody else, and you never know what the state is. Right? And so the, the, the tools have to make an assumption about the state, and many times that assumption is actually incorrect. Now, why am I actually saying this issue with JavaScript? Well, JavaScript is heavily based on global variables, all right? And so now you had a situation where we know globals are bad, but yet we have them in things like JavaScript, Python. All our scripting languages have these. And so that's when we actually are now starting to study to understand the effect of, of things like that in this area because we do have tools that work really well on the JavaScript side, like you have the, the JS, Lin, and so forth. But the question now is that how many of those are actually false positives? 
When I look at the JS Lint, I'm looking at, I'm noticing most of it's more stylistic issues, right? The, 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 how you actually write the code. It's not really looking at the full flow of the code and so forth. So that's a whole other can of worms that we haven't really started to, to address. But with this idea, and this is a case where um, software is moving much faster than what our tools can handle and, and address. And that's a daunting problem that we need to deal with. Otherwise, we don't know what kind of vulnerabilities that we are potentially putting into the software. Any other questions? All right, I guess that's it. Well, thank you for your time. <laughs>